the DG of NCDC, Dr. Chikwe Hikwazu, who joins us from our studios in Abuja. Good morning, sir. Thank you for coming on again today. Well, it really is morning, sometimes you just wonder, but uh, we're wishing all of you who are, you know, in the front lines and doing what you can, all the best, because this can indeed be challenging. For instance, look at what's playing out in Kano. There are so many questions already concerning what is happening there. Uh, but at the moment, even though, yes, there's some explanation, but we'd like to hear from you about the scenario in Kano, why it appears as though there are two results at the moment. Um, there are not two results. We announced a number of new cases in Kano last night, uh, bringing the global total to 407 in the country. Um, these tests, we rely on them. Uh, we share it with the states. We just activated the lab in Kano a few days ago. Uh, so these are the results of the increased testing capacity that we're providing for the country. Uh, the tests are fairly robust. I can't say they're 100%, but they're as close to that as possible. And so, you know, we have to come to terms with the reality. These are the results that we have and act on them and not waste too much time doubting whether the results are true or not. The key thing, uh, like we would have noticed, we had, uh, I think, the highest number of uh, positive cases in a single day uh, since the onset of the outbreak. We're testing a lot more. Uh, that is beginning to show. Uh, we can't hide this outbreak, so we will do our best to uh, show uh, you know, share with Nigerians what we're finding. That in itself will stimulate more response from uh, various aspects of government. There's almost only so much we can do from NCDC. We're working with the state governments. They actually own the response at the state and local levels. We need all of them now to come in and scale whatever we're doing, facing the reality that, listen, uh, all those rumors I tried to negate in the past and people were doubtful about whether you know some there's some form of immunity among black people there's some uh, something in our weather that will prevent transmission you know we were trying so hard to um, uh, dispute uh, these when there was a, it was a hypothetical situation and really push Nigerians to prepare. But, you know, I think we were looking for a magic bullet. Uh, unfortunately, there's none. So we really have to face the reality that this is an outbreak. This is a virus. It will circulate in Nigeria. Absolutely no doubt about that. And our responsibility as a country is to prepare more, uh, to be able to detect, uh, isolate, treat, list contacts, and stop transmission. Very hard, much easier said than done in a complex country with its population density and its unique challenges. And that's what we're facing every day. So I really urge all of us now to really face the challenge that we have and leave all those small disputes around this or that to the side. We have a big problem ahead of us. And sometimes it sounds like we're fiddling over the details while Rome is burning. So we must focus on the problem at hand. And that's really what we're encouraging all of us to do at state federal level focus on the challenge we can't get ahead of it but we can't do that if we're you know disputing lab results and fighting over details of uh, things that are not really relevant to the big response we just we just want to know why there seems to be that discrepancy so the ncdc puts out a figure for example for kano is at 16 uh, for ncdc but from the state government it is 21. I noticed that for Lagos also, over the past couple of days, there's always been a difference of three. So the NCD reports a certain figure, and Lagos State's Ministry of Health reports a figure that, that, that is three, uh, three cases more than what the NCD is recording. So we just want to understand, because there are a lot of questions. People are asking, why is there that discrepancy? So in the Lagos State uh, scenario, it was a very simple thing. The people were tested in Lagos, but they actually live in Ogun State, so they were reallocated. Uh, to another state, uh, to a good state, eventually in our records. So, um, you know, this, uh, this is how this thing happens. We manage uh, a line list for the entire country. We collect all our information through a digital surveillance uh, system called SOMAS, which we're implementing in every state. So for every uh, confirmed case that we have, we understand who the person is, their details, their address, uh, their
their symptoms and the date of lab confirmation. So, you know, there's absolutely no doubt in terms of where the numbers are. Uh, sometimes there's some discrepancy because of communication with the states we are communicating, remember, with 36 plus one states. Uh, there's never been a time in, in, in my lifetime where we have managed a, a pandemic where you have ongoing outbreaks in 20, we have teams deployed. You have to imagine this, we have teams deployed in 22 states and this is only going to increase. So of course, in the initial two, three days, there will be some discrepancies of numbers here and there, but you, you know, those will be sorted out uh, very soon as we uh, align our figures. But the issue really is to focus on, on where the challenge is. You know, I was listening to your broadcast just before I came on, and on the front page of Trust, I saw the headline that says, you know, that, that kind of depicted the Lassa fever situation in Nigeria. You know, nobody's talking about that, we're responding. Over the past four months, we've been responding to the largest larger fever outbreak ever reported in any country anywhere in the world. Over a thousand cases, close to 200 deaths. Why haven't you heard about this? Because we've been responding as effectively as we have. You know, so the challenges are not simple. So anyone that I, I've heard a lot of emotion, and I understand where it's coming from about. Uh, you know, test more, you know, that, that we want to, you know, but unfortunately, we, we have to work with what we have. And that's what we're trying so hard to do. And you can start see, you can see the results every day we're testing more in, uh, Abuja and Lagos, we have intensified efforts with the state governments to go out to hospitals to collect samples, to go to certain communities where we think there might be more uh, infections happening, to collect more samples, and that's why you're now seeing the results. But the results are not what anyone would like. We're going to find more cases, uh, so we have to find a way to smoothen out what we want is for the COVID-19 response to be just like the Lassa response in a way, where it can happen within uh, a context where we start restarting parts of the economy and the and, uh, end of our lives, you know. So we've responded to Lhasa smoothly and nobody shut down the country uh, because it, it wasn't necessary because the response was fairly efficient. And now COVID is at a much larger scale. We're responding to something across, at the moment, 22 states, but it will grow to almost every state in Nigeria. There's no reason why it won't. It is a virus, a respiratory virus. So what we're trying to achieve right now in the short term is not to stop transmission, because we know that that would be very difficult to do. No country in the world has achieved that. Uh, even China has seen a reintroduction and a slight uh, increasing number of outbreaks again. Not to the same extent, but definitely happening again. So what we are trying to achieve, and this is very important for Nigerians to understand, is a landscape where we can continue our work, continue our work in responding while we restart parts of the economy. So how do we achieve that? These are the efficiencies that we're now trying to achieve so that by the time this lockdown ends, we're in a position, we're in a much better position to restart our lives. But life will never be the same. It will not be the same and Nigerians have to prepare for a different type of life once the lockdown starts. And that's really my big message today. Life will not be the same as we knew it before COVID-19. A lot of the changes that we have introduced into society, we will have to continue in the short term. Well, no doubt, everyone already believes that you know, things are gonna, so many things are gonna change. But you mentioned uh, sample collection the other time and we heard the Lagos State Government said that they have visited about 118,000 households um, in Lagos and collecting samples and made some discoveries up to about 119. But well, one of the questions that someone asked about that is, uh, can you confirm how long a COVID-19 uh, result takes to come out? But the main question the fellow is asking is, the results are the results out immediately and the person taken to isolation center or they take the sample and leave and come back to get the patient? This person is concerned that the chances of a positive patient infecting others before they come for him is very high. How do you respond? Yeah, so let, let me explain the, the cycle because it's important for colleagues to understand. Uh, so generally, uh, when you have a symptom, the first thing you do is you call a call center, right? 
Now, once you call a call center, someone, uh, several teams uh, working in Lagos in parallel, someone is assigned that uh, call to come to your house to collect a, a sample. For him to do that, he needs two things. Something we call a nasopharyngeal swab uh, to collect the sample. This is a gentleman on your screen doing so. And secondly, a virus transport medium, because you have to keep what the sample that has been collected in a small bottle to preserve the virus. So not easy. He has to have those materials, have to have the PPE he needs to protect himself while collecting the sample. That sample is now taken uh, to a central lab where there's a distribution system. That sample is now pooled with several others and distributed to one of the three labs in Lagos where we're testing. From one of those three labs, uh, once it gets there, a process starts, the actual testing. This is a seven-hour process. If you're negative, the results are shared with your state epidemiologist, the surveillance team, almost immediately. If it's positive, we have to run a second round just to be sure that it is positive. So for every positive sample, it, it takes a bit longer. Now, when it comes out, it goes to the state team. The state team now has to sort the positives and the negatives, contact the individual. If it's negative, it's a fairly straightforward phone conversation. If it's positive, as he's contacting them, they're arranging an ambulance. That ambulance has to be ready to pick up the patient. That ambulance is now dispatched to pick the person. We then have to decide on which of the several care facilities in Lagos this individual is being it will be taken to. There's a conversation. Not everybody is ready to jump into the ambulance. These are human beings. They need to prepare. So sometimes they're not ready. We're not the police. We're not going to carry them and put them into the ambulance by force. No. So there's often a preparatory uh, time. They're being canceled. Their families are being canceled. Often there's a two, three hour process. And sometimes it's quicker, but others. Sometimes it's an elderly gentleman or lady. We have to wait, encourage, enable, let them pack. And then take into one of the three centers. We have to decide on which of the three, depending on the level of severity. So I've gone into this explanation for Nigerians to really understand. This is not a simple process. So what we're doing at the moment is a lot of uh, operational management, uh, getting these operations right from the beginning of the food chain to the end. It's an extremely complex problem. We've been getting better over it over time. Um, you know, it's getting shorter, more efficient. We now understand a lot of the bottlenecks. But, you know, if anyone thinks this is simple in Lagos, you have to rethink uh, your understanding of the context that we work in. So I, th these are the challenges that we face. And together with the government of Lagos State, the World Health Organization, all our partners that we're working with, we're determined to get this process to work simpler. But there are human issues involved, too. Remember, every case is a human being. We have to respect certain things. Sometimes they're slow. Sometimes they're ill. So we have to manage these situations as they come up. And but it's doc, not as can, simple can I, as, I just you know, you take something you from moment. the shop, you take it home and plug it in. If and I that's can what just we're interject to you, Doc. Uh, the, the question here is the concern that in the process of... Uh, the testing being conducted, the concern that this fellow is, is uh, having, and which a number of people may have as well, is between the time the testing is being conducted and the time the result comes out that the pe fellow is positive, and there are chances that the person may have unwittingly uh, infected other people in the household. You're absolutely right. And that's why we ha started a campaign called Take Responsibility. So if, if you know in your household that the father or mother is not feeling well and we're coming or we have come to collect a sample, from that time, uh, the household needs to go through some self-isolation, leave the individual, protect the rest of the family, and make sure that we can uh, ensure that contact is limited to the person that is ill. So we as citizens, we have to take some responsibility. The whole point that where we come to the end and we do contact tracing, that is the purpose of it, to now identify who may have been in contact with this individual. But the, community, the, the country has to help us. So as, as soon as you think you're ill, uh, ill enough to ask for a sample to be collected or make that phone call to the call center, that's the point where you need to start self-isolating. Inform your family and your friends, listen, I'm not feeling well. 
Um, uh, I've called for a sample to be collected. Please let me stay in my room. Uh, don't bother coming to hug me. Uh, in fact, you shouldn't be doing that anyway, but in the context of a family, this happens. So th this is what we can't solve everything from the government side. We really encourage every family, uh, especially in the high incidence areas, you know, to take some responsibility for that, this themselves uh, once they think they're ill, even before the result comes out positive. Is it a, now that, I mean, these results and these cases seem to be popping up much more in some other areas, some states, is it a bad idea for NCDC and perhaps states to, uh, moving forward, also name the areas where these cases uh, are coming up such that people can have an idea that, look, these are not just numbers. They are people, and perhaps they may be closer to people than they actually think in order to drive home that reality. Yeah. Uh, Chamberlain, you know, I think this is a very important point, and I understand where it's coming from. It's coming from a very good place. But you know, our message re listen, is, is really, we want everyone to carry out these prevention uh, measures that we're advising. And mm -hmm. the second thing, because it's, it's, even if someone is a little bit far from you, you think, uh, the, you know, we, we move around and very soon uh, we will start moving around a bit more and we need people to get used to these measures, whether you're living in one part of town or the other. So, you know, localizing this really doesn't help us. But the more important issue is we need to avoid stigmatization of people, of areas, and of any group of people. Because once there's a perception that most people come from this part of town or that part of the state, the natural reaction, and this is an emotional reaction from any normal human being, is to think that everyone in that area is somehow carrying something that we, you know, it's kind of unclean or we don't want. And it's simply not true. You know, this is a virus. We have to understand that those infected haven't done any harm. They haven't committed a crime. They are not being punished. They're just unfortunate to have caught a virus that any of us, including myself and yourself, could catch. Uh, despite how careful we are, we've seen this happen in the most advanced countries in the world. We've seen presidents, we've seen the UK Prime Minister become infected despite knowing as much as he does. We've seen the UK Minister of Health become infected. So this is not a virus that is going to respect anyone or uh, people living or not living in any community. So our, our message really is to every Nigerian, do your best. Take personal responsibility. Do the things that we've advised. And on, on our side, my commitment to Nigeria is that we will keep working very hard to do what we can do to prevent transmission to you or to others, make sure our healthcare workers are safe. But there are no easy solutions, no magic bullets, and this will be a marathon, not a sprint. So we need to be prepared for the long haul. All you said recently that the challenge is not exactly with laboratory testing. You say we have capacity in that area. And you said the challenge is, in fact, getting those right samples and ensuring that, you know, they get to your laboratories and ensuring that they have even the right samples in the first place. But before we touch on that, I, I recall you also said, well, we're moving from 1,500 uh, tests per day to 4,000. That's the target in the coming days. But so far, it, it's kind of hard to get a sense of how many tests we have done so far. So, and I know you, you have that firsthand. So how many tests have we done so far? first so we're going to release the numbers at the end of Friday and we're going to release those numbers every Friday moving forward uh, last Friday was just over 5,000 so we're going to increase we're going to let the country know exactly how many we've done by by next by the end of Friday and we'll do that every Friday so people know um, we've added a lot more labs so we have to collect that information so it's, it's a little bit more complex than you imagine so we've made a commitment end of Friday every week we will release that information. The key thing about testing, um, I've tried to explain the process severally. Uh, we've been waiting on some supplies uh, to include our HIV testing infrastructure, to include it into our laboratory processing. The equipment has been ready for weeks. We've been waiting for the supplies to come. The first batch has just arrived today. So as soon as we get our hands on it, we will inc include it into our testing processes. There's another set of equipment originally used for TB uh, called G2 
gene expert. We're also converting that to COVID-19 testing. Again, the equipment has been ready. There's a global, global supply chain bottleneck around reagents. So we've been working very hard with our partners to unblock that. We're hoping to get our first supply soon. And these are not issues that money or whatever can solve. This is a global shortage of reagents. So now, as soon as we get this in, we will be able to scale radically our testing capabilities. Um, Side. You know, there's a, a lot of uh, chatter around uh, simplifying testing, using antigen antibody testing. The honest truth is a lot of these things don't work. And many countries that say they will start using it uh, it was a big headline story in the UK. They haven't started. The reason is you need to have a test that you know works. And until we get there, we are stuck with this PCR testing. We're now going to use, move to some high throughput uh, mechanisms. We have this equipment in Lagos, Abuja, Joss, um, I think Oka, two more other locations. And that will really enable us scale our testing. Right. And, the and that's side. really the, at the heart of the question many people are asking. Right. On Friday, we'll have the data, and every Friday, we'll share that with Nigerians. Right, we'll be looking forward to that. But the other side of the question is personnel. Well, it seems we don't have a challenge as much with equipment and getting that. But personnel, and one of our viewers sent in this message yesterday saying that, don't you think there's a need, since we're saying we don't have enough personnel, there's a need to involve the private health experts who have reliable capacity to carry out a assignment being done at the NCDC. Is that something you're looking into to expand your workforce capacity so you can reach uh, those areas which hitherto might have been difficult to reach? Yeah. So absolutely, we're doing this right now. The, the lab in Kaduna actually is a private sector lab that we've just included in our network because we've, uh, we went there, we saw they have the equipment and the knowledge and infrastructure and safety. And that's one critical aspect in our evaluation to do the work. We're right now in uh, late discussions with a, a private sector group in Lagos uh, to start testing. In fact, they've started, they're going through their quality assurance test now. So before they start, we send them a panel of samples that are positive and negative that we know. Uh, we ask them to run the same things and see whether they will get the same results that we know are correct. So that's what we're doing. That's really a critical step to ensure that they have the quality that we require uh, to share with Nigerians that, yes, this lab is ready. So it's not a simple process. Uh, the tests that we need to do um, are not things that most private labs do routinely uh, in Nigeria. Um, they simply don't. So those that understand will do. You need to have a certain biosafety environment to be able to do this test. Uh, you need to have certain processes, use PPEs even while testing to a large extent. So it's a fairly complex process, but we are inviting the private sector whoever thinks that they're ready to do this, please let us know. We will send a team to you. We will evaluate your setup. And once you're ready, we'll include you in the network. This has been the approach in some other countries like South Africa, but they have a much more developed laboratory architecture, which we simply did not have. But there are a few upcoming labs now. We've visited one in, in Oweri. We've visited one in Newi. Um, I told you about the one in Lagos. We've advised the two in Oweri and in Newi on what they need to do uh, to meet up on the standards, and they're working on it. So there are quite a number of efforts going, out around, uh, going on right now across the country. And whoever is ready, we will jump at the opportunity of including in the network. We'll come back to you uh, when we return from those breaks so we can get uh, a lot more and then conclude after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, Dr. Ikwazu, you talked about uh, in several responses in several fora when you were referring to uh, the samples, the testing, getting all of those sorted. We've heard you use the word the right people several times. You know that it's not just about testing. You have to get the right people to collect the samples and get them to the lab. So what exactly is the enormity of the challenge that we have regarding personnel and having the right people get those samples to the centers? Yeah. 
So, Chamberlain, I think this is such an important question, and really credit goes to the state governments because, you know, if I think about the level of operation that Lagos has had to put together over the last few weeks, it's, it's really been incredible. You know, the same at the FCT, the same is happening in many other states across the country as they get more cases. They find out that, listen, the small public health team, you know, every state used to have a, a state epidemiologist, a few people around him, one disease surveillance and notification officer uh, in every local government. And, and literally that was it. That was all that most states had in terms of their public health workforce. But they're now recognizing that they had to scale this very quickly. And you had to very quickly train people um, to be able to understand the importance of collecting samples, but also the skills. Uh, Taking a nasopharyngeal swab from someone safely is not the simplest thing in the world to do. Uh, people don't realize that. So we've had to train people very quickly to do this while protecting themselves. Uh, this is really not easy to do to scale and to do quickly, but we've done that and the states have really led on this. The other thing is to identify the right people to take samples from. So yes, there's a lot of pressure to test more, but there's no point in just going somewhere and testing random people. We have to test people most likely to have the disease, so we're efficient in our case finding uh, process. So that's really, uh, we spent the last week, I was in Lagos personally over the weekend working with teams to fine tune these processes in order to now redefine the strategy. And that's why uh, in Lagos and in Abuja, we uh, introduced, in addition to all that we're doing, a more aggressive case finding uh, approach where uh, in, in, we've set up specific locations in, in specific health centers where people can now come in themselves if they're not feeling well, get a sample collected. We have teams going around the uh, hospitals, teams belonging to Lagos state government that we have trained, going around hospitals in Lagos, trying to identify people that may have this infection and collect the sample because many of the cases that we've reported recently have just been reported too late, and especially the deaths. They didn't even have an opportunity of coming into care because they were being managed in private hospitals. So we're now uh, really trying to address this in these two places. So that's what I mean uh, with the right people which means quickly scaling the workforce, collecting samples from the right patients, uh, which is both, uh, which is both, imp both aspects are important to achieve the results that we need to achieve. So uh, please, uh, you know, I just need to be patient with us, but I, I am absolutely proud of the work uh, being done at very short intervals with a lot of intensity uh, by governments, uh, state governments primarily across the country. Uh, Chamberlain, yesterday I was in a teleconference with uh, most governors in Nigeria. I I've never seen a time that the leadership of this country at all levels has been so focused on this problem. My challenge to all of them is to keep this focus going and let's build a team now that will support us now but will also carry us into the future. In, in terms of public health response. And, and, and that's really very good to hear. So we do hope that at least that will be a basis for us to also uh, build on moving forward. I mean, rightly, people will make mistakes and it's expected. So we expect to learn from our mistakes and then uh, do better next time. But I, I did ask you a couple of days ago off record about the sudden index case in Benue. So I'm wondering, would you like to speak about that for those who may misunderstand how all of that is happening and not internalize the wrong things? Um, so, Chairman, I'd rather not go into detail about uh, single individuals. Uh, we manage the public health response. The clinicians manage the clinical response. But I, I think on that particular patient, you know, she was one of our earlier cases. Um, you know, there are a few circumstances that were not ideal. We have learned from that. Uh, but, we, you know, the, the challenge with this disease, some people are not really ill clinically and yet the test positive and sometimes the virus is very stubborn so um, the the well but still carry the virus for long periods so if you're very sick and in a hospital um, nobody needs to convince you to stay in a hospital but if you feel that you're well but 
you have a virus that can be spread to others. It's, a, it's not an easy conversation to explain why it is important for you to remain in isolation and in treatment. And this is really the underlying scenario in this case. Um, a test result has remained positive. There's no ill intent. It is what it is. But this individual is feeling well. And uh, we have a number of patients in a similar situation right now. We really appeal to them, if they're watching this program, to just be a bit patient. Um, we can't regulate this virus. Sometimes it clears in a week. Sometimes it takes three weeks. Um, we will work as soon as we get a negative result. We will celebrate your discharge, um, just like we celebrate I think 128 people have been discharged out of the 407 we have. So we celebrate every discharge as a big success and a big victory for us, the healthcare workers, and for all Nigerians that are wishing all of us to recover. So please be a bit patient with us. We will get to this at the end of this journey. If another sample needs to be collected, please co cooperate with the healthcare workers. We all want all of you to be discharged home as quickly as possible. Um, we know that, yes, we're trying to see how much and how long, how to deal with all of this. Yes, it is indeed novel. But you also did say uh, in your submissions earlier on that before we open part of the economy. So I I'm wondering, trying to understand that a lot better. Do what is the thinking, uh, the committee or perhaps yourself? Are we looking... Do we have to have no samples whatsoever in the entire country before we open the economy? Or are we looking to see, well, if you get to a certain stage, and what stage will it be before we can open the economy? Will it be holistic, or is it part of the economy that will open, as you said, in passing? So thanks, Chamberlain. Um, I think the key thing, uh, firstly, is for everyone to recognize is, the, is Mr. President's prerogative to decide on when to start uh, restarting parts of life and parts of the economy. Uh, the, our, our information is one of the streams of information that he uses, obviously, to make this decision. But there are also streams of information from the economy, from the security forces. All of this come together to lead him to make a decision that is not easy, because there's no right or wrong decision. He has to make a decision balanced, uh, balancing uh, so different things and then uh, making a decision that is appropriate for the entire country. So I, I, at the moment, I'm glad not to be in his shoes. But the key thing is, Chamberlain, is the goal of the lockdown is not to get to the end of uh, this outbreak because that is not a realistic goal. The goal of the lockdown is, was to, there are two things. Firstly, to keep people a little bit apart so we stop uh, transmission to some extent. And even though the lockdown has not been perfect, we have all sorts of indicators to show that we're mixing a lot less. Um, you know, there are some uh, analytics from Google that shows us that in many of the places that we meet and congregate is down to 67 by 60, 70 percent. So there's no doubt there's less contact between individuals. And that has hopefully had an impact on transmission. But the second goal is to was to enable the public health response to build up its efficiency. And that's really what we have focused on the last two weeks and what we will work very hard on in the next uh, uh, 10 days to make sure that we finalize. So that this whole chain that I described in the beginning can work uh, seamlessly. So this is just to let everyone know that we are not anticipating that in the next 10 days we will get to zero. We are anticipating that we will have a public health response that can work while slowly people start going about their small businesses. I don't anticipate a situation where everything will be open and you know, schools will open, markets will open, airports will reopen on the same day. No, I think there will be a graduate, gradual increase, a very carefully calibrated reopening of the economy and certain things, our behaviors in shops, in schools, you know, some of the social distancing that we have introduced. Every business right now should be preparing, thinking, how do I run my business differently? 
How do I run my restaurant differently? How do I organize my school and teaching differently in the context of COVID-19? So there will be a new COVID-19 era that will not be the same as the pre-COVID-19. And I really encourage every small business, every community to be thinking about this. Because at some point, Mr. President will have to reopen the country slowly. And people have to, at the same time, we have to keep trying to prevent transmission. So we have to find a middle, a middle path between a lockdown country and one that is able to respond to the big public health challenge that we have uh, facing us. Very quickly, uh, add to this in very, very few words, Prof, uh, Dr. Uh, Hekwazu. Very, very quickly, you referenced something I think you have already begun in that trajectory of life after COVID-19 lockdown. What are some of those things you referenced earlier? You said our lives are not going to remain the same afterwards. You've added how, we sh how businesses will begin to conduct themselves post-COVID-19 lockdown. What other things should people begin to work towards right now? So some are simple, you know, coming into your studio this morning, there were things I did that I didn't have to do before I came in. Um, it's unlikely that after the lockdown, uh, you will remove those things. You will have to continue um, for the foreseeable future. If I were running a restaurant that I would normally have a capacity of 100, I will now have to plan how can I run that restaurant with 50, not 100, so I can keep people sufficiently apart. If I had a school, if I was running a school and, you know, during uh, there's a break time that I open up uh, the playgrounds to a thousand pupils, I'll be thinking about how do I uh, ar arrange my break time so a quarter goes out at some point, the next quarter has a different break, the next quarter has a different break. So that's the kind of thinking. I, I don't have all the answers, but what I'm encouraging everyone is to think about how they will run their lives differently in order to stay safe while returning to life. And there's no prescription around this because, you know, businesses are different, schools, markets are different, supermarkets, our roads, our societies are different. So what I'm really encouraging every Nigerian is to start thinking about a post-lockdown era and how they will arrange their lives differently, sustain their hand washing, sustain the sanitizers, sustain the masks as necessary, and sustain the physical distancing that we've been encouraging everyone to act on. And let me use my final word to just uh, say we've learned so much from the likes of uh, Professor Tomori. Um, it's not that we don't know uh, as a country. It's just that sometimes we haven't done what we know. And I, I don't think the best time to plant a tree, they say, is 100 years ago. The next best time is today. So really, um, with, with my team and with many public health workers across the country, we are determined not to drop the ball this time. But we are not there yet. We have to work on the present uh, challenge that we have, make sure we get over this, and not stop building from there as we move into the future. Well, thank you very much indeed for your time uh, talking to us this morning, Dr. Chikwe Kwazu, the DG of NCDC. All the best to you and your team.